Last week, we looked at this incredible victory of God over Jericho, a city that had fortified itself, had uh, walls, as I pointed out, had an 11-foot plastered scrape, and then a 35-foot wall on top of that was basically impregnable as far as the Israelites were concerned, but God had a plan, and the Israelites obeyed exactly what God said to do, and God brought an incredible victory. The walls came tumbling down. The Israelites went in, and they killed the inhabitants of Jericho. They kept the metals for the Lord, and then everything else was burned. There was a portion of the northern wall that did not collapse, and I believe that is where Rahab the harlot was at. Her and her family experienced grace and was saved from the disaster because she had believed in the God of mercy, the Israelites God of earth and heaven, as she says in chapter two. She hung up the scarlet thread, which means hope. Her, her hope was in the symbol of faith and God rewarded her for that. The world is symbolized in Jericho, the this was the first city that the Israelites would uh, come against, and therefore it, it kind of represented the whole nation. The world is a system that excludes Christ. It defies God's order. It resists his will, and that's exactly what Jericho was doing. They were resisting the will of God, fortifying themselves against the word of God. And the things of the world are really upside down from what the things of God are. Uh, the world says, climb the corporate ladder, step on people to get ahead. But scripture tells us that we are to take the low place and serve others. The world says that when you've been wronged, get even. But scripture tells the believer not to return evil for evil, but return good for evil. And the entire thinking, the philosophies of the world really oppose God. They're, they're, they exclude Christ, his teachings, and, and the will of God. And so, as we learned last week, there's three enemies of the believer. We're introduced to the world, is symbolized by Jericho in chapter 6. We're going to pick up Ai this evening, which represents the flesh, and then we'll get to the Gibeonites, which represents the trickery of the devil. And so for overcoming the world, we renew our minds and we do not conform. Who's born of God overcomes the world. It's our victory. And so as we rest in our faith in what God has said and don't conform, we have victory over the world. And so the Israelites were victorious over Jericho because they held fast in faith. Uh, they did not conform, but they were transformed by their mind and prove the, the good, acceptable, perfect will of God in their actions. So that brings us to chapter 7, and this is a sad chapter. This is the only chapter that we read of Israelite fatalities during the entire conquest. So we read in chapter 7, verse 1, But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the cursed thing for Achan, uh, the son of Carmi, the son of Zebdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took of the cursed things so that the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua. And said to him, Do not let all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not worry all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So about three thousand men went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about thirty-six men, for they chased them from before the gate of she bar him and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face beside the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel 
and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? To deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. O oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? So the Lord said to Joshua, Get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things, and have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but, threw their back, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction." Neither will I be with you any more, unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed things from among you. We'll pause our reading there. Ai was situated uh, further west from Jericho. It would be basically be the next city if Israel continued marching west that they would come into. Bethel was smaller than Ai and maybe two or three miles to the northwest of Ai. These two cities were closely connected. And as we will see in chapter eight, they both engaged in the battle. So after the great victory in Jericho and and you might recall that God said anyone who took of uh, the accursed things of the city would be destroyed. He got the metals, the iron, the gold, the silver. Uh, those were to be stored uh, with in the treasury. They were his. Everything else was to be burned. The Hebrew word for curse means devoted. That's how it's used in Leviticus. And what is God's it is to remain God's. Uh, man is not to put his hands on what is God's. And if so, he becomes accursed. It wasn't that the materials themselves were wrong or evil. It's when we lust after them and take them for ourselves, what is God's, that is what brings the, the condemnation. So we have a man, Achan, and we're going to find out that he took some of the things of Jericho that should have been burned or were the, was the Lord's. Joshua doesn't know this. He sends two spies to, to spy out Ai. It's a smaller city than Jericho. And Jericho, the battle was so easy. No Hebrew lost their lives that the spies came back and said, hey, this is a piece of cake compared to what we just did at Jericho. Just send two or 3,000 men. That'll be enough to, to mop it up. We, this city is so small, we really don't need to go to the Lord and bother him with this one, right? That's, this is the, what the flesh does. It reasons of its own strength and its own wisdom, and it doesn't involve God in the decision-making. Well, we learned in chapter one that every victory is the Lord's victory. We can't do anything for the kingdom of God if the Lord be not with us. Uh, I mentioned last week, that's what the Lord told his disciples in John chapter 15, verse 3. But Paul says in Philippians 4 that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But we got to have the Lord with us in unbroken fellowship and communion. And God is not in communion with the nation of Israel. He's angry at them because someone in the camp secretly took what was his. And they've, they've hid it. And they've been deceptive about it. So we see here the, the power and the wisdom of the flesh in the response of the spies and also that Joshua doesn't consult the Lord. He just listens to the spies. He sends 3,000 men. And guess what? It isn't like it was before. Instead of having total control over the battle, 
they know right away something is not going right. And the Israelites flee uh, before the men of Ai. And matter of fact, 36 men lose their lives because of this sin of Achan. Well, when Joshua hears about it, he tears his clothes. The elders of Israel tear their clothes. They put dust on their, their heads. And in all of the life of Joshua, this is really the only time that he doesn't set a good example. He's a lovely type of Christ. Joshua means Jehovah's salvation, the same as Jesus in the New Testament. But in here, he's not a type of Christ. Uh, he's in the flesh. He's basically whining about the situation. Well, God, why didn't you just leave us on the other side of the Jordan? It'd be a lot safer over there than here. Because now when all our enemies hear how we have been uh, defeated by this little town of uh, Ai, it's going to be bad for us. Uh, one of the practical things we learn about this is we should never go to the Lord in prayer and whine. Uh, whining before the Lord is not a good thing to do. Uh, it, the problem here was clearly with Israel. It wasn't with the Lord's faithfulness. It wasn't with the Lord not keeping his word. The Lord was angry with his people because of secret sin, and he had broke off communion. And without him, they would not be victorious in battle. And so the offense was twofold in verse 11, for they have even taken some of the cursed things, the devoted things, the things that were God's, they've stolen from God, that angered the Lord, and then they've been deceptive about it. They've been hiding it among their own things. Twofold infraction, transgression that had angered the Lord. And then in verse 12, the consequences would be, therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies. Why? Secondly, neither will I be with you anymore. So you're not going to be able to stand before your enemies. And by the way, I'm not with you anymore. It wasn't that God was forsaking his covenant with his people, but because of sin, his fellowship with them had been broken off. He wasn't going to assist them. And without God's power in the situation, they had no hope of taking Cana as an inheritance and distributing the land to each of the tribes for their possession. So what's the solution? Well, this is always the solution. Sanctification. Be set apart for, for God. Get out of the world. Uh, get out of the flesh. Sanctify yourselves. Come clean and stand with the Lord. And so the people sanctify themselves. We clearly learn from this passage, and this is something we can apply in the church age, that sin in the camp angers the Lord. Secret idols angers the Lord. Taking what is the Lord's angers the Lord. So these are practical things that, that we can apply to our own lives. So the congregation came together the next morning. They sanctified themselves. And then each tribe is brought before the Lord. Uh, one tribe is taken, the tribe of Judah. And then they go down through the clans and the family. And it comes to one man, Achan. It says in verse 19, now Joshua said to Achan, my son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them and took them. And there they are, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent, with the silver under it. So Joshua sends messengers. They go to Achan's tent, and it's as Achan says, they found the Babylonian garment. They find the gold. They find the silver. Then Joshua and all Israel took Achan, they take the silver, the garments, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkey, his sheep, his tents, all that he had, and brought them to the valley of Achor. Achor means trouble, to the valley of trouble. And Joshua said, 
Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place had been called the Valley of Achor to this day. Well, it's a sad story. This man sinned. He basically, his family were accomplices to it, and surely they knew about it. Uh, but Achan is a representative of his family, and everything that is associated with Achan basically gets put to death is, or is burned. It's completely decimated and destroyed. Keep in mind that our subject matter here is the flesh. And so we're learning some things about how to practically deal with our flesh. Achan coveted what he knew he should not have. And that's where sin starts. We don't check our lusting. The, the beauty of being in the, the church age is we are called to present living sacrifices to the Lord of our bodies, Romans 12, 1 through 2. And so we have this opportunity. We have the world and we have the flesh. Uh, we have even the devil trying to pull us off the truth and trying to pull us away from what God wants us to do. And yet when we say, I'm not going to follow that. I'm going to consecrate myself to the Lord and follow the Lord. That is a living sacrifice. We don't have to kill the bullock or the ram. We just have to put to death what our own desires are that are outside the will of God. And it costs us something. When we don't do what we want to do, that costs us something. And we did what God wanted to do, and that pleases him. That's a sacrifice. Some beautiful verses in the New Testament. I'll share this too with the this idea of mortification. I, I mean, we grieve for Achan's family, the children, the wife. I mean, even the animals were put to death. And that's a picture of how to deal with the flesh. It's total mortification putting to death. Uh, there's no midway point. If you give in to your lusting at all, it'll just be stronger the next day. And so the only solution to the flesh is mortification. We're either going to gratify or mortify. If you gratify on Monday, the flesh will just want more on Tuesday. So first of all, let's look at Colossians chapter 3. Paul is talking to the church at Colossae, and he, he tells them about uh, putting to death their members in chapter 3, verse 5. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon sons of disobedience. Well, we just saw that in Joshua chapter 7. And so he says, put to death, mortify your members. In other words, don't strengthen the flesh's resolve to do what's against God by doing these deeds of the flesh. If you engage in these things, you just strengthen the flesh's resolve to stand against God. And so you, you starve and you put to death these evil deeds. You don't do them. You, you imprint a different pattern of life that God has his endorsement that, that pleases him, and you don't engage in what doesn't. And if you just say no, to say no, to say no, the energy of that lusting and that coveting diminishes. Some of us have strongholds in our mind. They didn't get built up in a day and they don't get tore down in a day. But with continual mortification, a dragging our feet, so to speak, the energy of that thing slowly loses its hold on us. And we set up new patterns of conduct and we just continue to mortify. And then in Romans chapter 8, Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7, this uh, dealing with the flesh. He's, he sees two laws in chapter 7, the, the law within his members that wants its own way. And then he sees the law of God in his mind. It's what he understands of the word of God. And he knows that's what he should do, but this law in his members wants its own way. 
and there's this constant battle going on with him. He says, I, I know what I should do, but I do it not. And that's the flesh's, uh, it's relentless to pull us away from the things that God wants. And I was talking and not looking up my verse, Romans 8, 13, he says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Death means separation in Scripture. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Put to death, the verb is in a, a present active tense. It's indicative. It's a statement of fact. And so the believer needs to be on constant duty as a good soldier. And as soon as one thought comes into our mind that doesn't pass the Philippians 4.8 test, it's uh, we just pull it out of our mind. Uh, we mortify it. We don't think on it. We don't let our imagination go with it. As soon as we sense that it doesn't have God's approval, we yank it out of our, our minds. Grew up working on a Charlet ranch, and so I have this little picture of little black calves running around in my head and just putting a little lasso around them and plucking them out. As soon as you know it doesn't belong there, that we should, it's not going to have God's endorsement, is it's not going to please the Lord, then we just get rid of it. We, we can't afford to let our imagination with it, let our lusting um, build on it. Now, the flesh doesn't make sense. There's an insanity to sin, and you can see it with Achan's response. Where in the world is he going to wear a Babylonian garment in the camp of the Israelites? He, he lusted after it, but he couldn't really wear it. I mean, that would be like me coming to preach in a swimming suit or something some Sunday morning. Everybody in the, everybody in the congregation would know what's up. Something's strange here. Something's wrong. The Israelites had very specific attire that they had to, to wear. And a Babylonian garment would have been as secular and worldly uh, as it could have come for a Jew. So he couldn't even wear the thing. Gold and silver make some sense, but these were the Lord's. He stole from the Lord, and it angered the Lord. So it is a grim chapter. This man lost his life, his family uh, lost their lives. But that is the seriousness of the, the offense and also the remedy, which is total mortification. No middle ground. The flesh only understands two things, gratification and mortification. And if we gratify uh, one day, it's going to be stronger the next. So we don't feed it to strengthen it by doing deeds of the flesh. And we also keep our minds in check and mortify any thought as soon as we see that it's not pleasing the Lord and we get rid of it. This is kind of encouraging. We see it in this chapter that there's restoration. And it's always that way with the Lord. Failures are never final unless we make them so. The, the righteous man falls seven times, gets back up, but the wicked fall into mischief. The man and woman of God, when we make a mistake, the first thing is to repent and confess it and get right with the Lord, and then we mortify. And this is how we deal with the flesh. We repent, we confess, and we mortify. Uh, Achan did confess the sin. Then there was total mortification with the death. And so this is how this is the pattern for dealing with the flesh shown to us in this chapter. It's a sad pattern, but uh, when the flesh gets its way in our lives, it's a sad outcome any way that you cut it. With the world, we don't conform. We renew our minds. And with the flesh, we repent and confess and we mortify. We don't engage in the deeds of the flesh and we don't let our minds uh, think on any thought that wouldn't can't be brought into the obedience of Christ. The Valley of Achor, the Valley of Trouble, was just that for the nation of Israel. 36 men lost their lives. I'm sure Achan was in misery as he was thinking about his Babylonian garment and looking at that little wedge of gold and a few shekels of silver, knowing that those things had cost the lives of 36 men. 36 funerals, 36 families grieving because of lost loved ones, because he lusted. And this is the laws of the harvest. You reap what you sow. If you plant wheat, you get wheat. And you reap later than what you sow. You don't plant 
wheat on Monday and then pull out the combine on Tuesday. And you reap much more than you sow, 30, 60, 100 fold. And so the, the consequences of the sin were enormous. I'm sure if Achan had counted the cost, if he knew what was going to come out of this, he wouldn't have taken and so it's good for us to think ahead. How many lives and ministries have been ruined with unchecked lusting, not bringing our thought lives into obedience to Christ, not mortifying the deeds of the flesh instead of engaging in them or trying to get away with much as we can and still making a provision for the flesh. It was a valley of, of trouble for Achan and his family and for the nation of Israel. But now that the sin had been dealt with, God, anger was appeased and God was now with his people. And so Hosea picks this up in chapter two, verse 15, and he talks about a future day in which the nation of Israel, the valley of Achor will turn into a door of hope. The valley of trouble will turn into a door of hope. And that's speaking of the future restoration of the nation of Israel during the tribulation period to the Lord. And so that's encouragement to us as well. None of us are perfect. We fall. That's repent, confess it as sin, ask for forgiveness, be restored to the Lord, get up in grace, learn from our mistakes, and then go on with the Lord. And he can turn our valley of trouble into a door of hope also. Well, in chapter 8, another practical thing that we see is that sin makes solutions a lot more difficult. We choose our sin. God chooses the consequences of our sin. But our sin brings about a, a whole sophistication of other issues, right? It starts out as one thing, but it splinters out. And so what started with a little thing ends up influencing a lot of other people, causing other problems. And so solutions to sin become more difficult. And so in chapter 8, God now comes to Joshua and says, all right, I have this plan. And it's a really elaborate plan. It would have been a very simple thing. I mean, the victory over Jericho was a simple a battle plan, and they followed it by faith, and there was complete victory. But because of past failures, the plan is quite elaborate in chapter 8, God's battle plan. But what is interesting is God is able to incorporate the past failures of his people into the future victory of his people. And so we learn from our mistakes, and God can actually take those things. How many new ministries have started from people who have had past failures? or past hardships. So in chapter 8, verse 1, we read, Now the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you, and arise and go up to Ai. Not 2,000, not 3,000. You take the whole army. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. And you shall go... And you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its cattle you shall take as a, uh, a booty of yourself. Lay an ambush for the city behind it. All right, so Joshua's going to send out 30,000 soldiers by night the day before the battle engages. That's in verse 3. Apparently 5,000 of these... 30,000 would lay an ambush for the smaller city. That's verse 12. So Joshua's going to use 30,000 troops to set an ambush for the cities of Ai and Bethel. Ai represents the flesh. The flesh is haughty. It's proud. It resists the will of God. And so I find it ironic. There's only 12,000 people in Ai which means if one-fourth of the whole population was their army, that would be 3,000 men, 3,000 soldiers. Given the last numbering of the nation of Israel, that would mean that 
the army of AI is outnumbered 168 to one. So keep that in mind. You have an, an army that's 168 times bigger than your army. And let's see how the flesh behaves, how the, the army of AI and its king behave uh, as the battle unfolds. Joshua takes the people, the rest of the army, the next morning and they, they come to Ai. And I'm gonna pick up now verse 13. And when they had set the people, all the army that was on the north of the city and its rear guard on the west of the city, Joshua went that night to the midst of the valley. Now it happened when the king of Ai saw it and the men of the city hurried and rose early and went out against Israel to battle. Keep in mind how, how badly they are outnumbered. Why would you leave a fortified city and go out to battle an army 168 times bigger than you are? But see, the flesh doesn't make any sense. The flesh is stupid. And we see the flesh behaving just like uh, flesh does in stupidity. And so this the people of AI, they come out and they're going to battle Joshua and his army. And it says in verse 15, Joshua and all Israel made as if they were beaten before them and fled by the way of the wilderness. It doesn't say there was any casualties, but they, they just started running away. The army of Ai is drawn out of the city, further away from the city, and the ambush kicks in. And apparently the armies out of uh, Bethel had also left their fortified city and they were uh, chasing the Israelites also. At that time, the 5,000 Hebrews that are set at ambush at Bethel and the, the 25,000 remaining set at ambush at Ai uh, charge into the city. They set it on fire. And when the armies of Ai and Bethel see their cities up in smoke, they lose heart. And now the trap is set. Now they're actually pinned against uh, two Israeli forces, and it's a total massacre. Notice that the Lord is the one directing the battle. It says in verse 18, the Lord said to Joshua, stretch out your spear that is in your hand toward Ai, and I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out his spear that was in his hand towards the city. And so that is was the signal. He sets up the spear when the ambushers see that, that was their signal to the charge of cities. This is God's plan. It's done God's way. It's being directed by the Lord, and it's a total victory. And this is, this is how we get the victory over the flesh. Uh, we give the flesh no uh, compensation. We give it no hearing. We give it no satisfaction. We don't even let our imagination go anywhere with the flesh. We just yield to the Lord. It's what he wants. It's Things are done his way, not the way of the flesh. We don't use our own wisdom. We don't use our own strength. We just completely yield to God. Every victory is the Lord's victory. It says in verse 25, I'll start in verse 24, and it came to pass when Israel had made an end of slaying all the inhabitants of Ai in the field in the wilderness where they pursued them, and when they had fallen by the edge of the sword until they were consumed, that all of the Israelites returned to Ai and struck it with the edge of the sword. So it was that all who fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, all the people of Ai, for Joshua did not draw back his hand with which he stretched out his spear until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. What's the solution to overcoming the flesh? Total mortification. There was no retreating. There was no pulling back until every individual in Ai was destroyed. A total mortification. And that's what happened here in Jericho. Total destruction of the inhabitants of Ai. The flesh is to be uh, mortified, it's lusting, it's to have no hold on the child of God. When we, we do error, we confess it, we, we repent, uh, we ask for forgiveness, we're restored with the Lord, we learn from our mistakes. Sometimes there's consequences of those sins. Usually there's consequences. And sometimes things become more complicated because of past sins. But God is for us. 
And as we get up in faith, learn from our mistakes, he still has a way of bringing out uh, his grace in our lives. And that's really the story from Joshua chapter seven and eight. So let's be careful. We don't want to take the things that are the Lord. We don't want to have secret idols. We don't um, want to deceive the Lord, just stand out in the, in the light and be honest with him, um, confessing our sins, being restored to him, getting up in grace and going on. The flesh is not to have any lusting. It's to be checked. It's to be mortified. <clears throat> so we don't um, do what uh, God would displease the Lord and, and break his heart and anger him, as we see in this chapter. So great practical uh, lessons from the battle of Ai and the battle of Bethel. Very practical for us, even in the church age. And Lord, we just would ask you to help us in these things. Uh, all of us have this nasty flesh nature within us that wants its own way, that opposes your will. And we pray, Father, that if there is something that we are doing, a behavior that displeases you, that we might just confess it as sin and from this day forward, mortify it and not engage in it. And, and then praise your name as we see that bent and that behavior lose its strength over us. Pray too, Lord, that we would be on active duty as a good soldier, taking every thought captive, just blasting it putting it to death as soon as we know that it displeases you, not letting it have um, any capacity in our minds to do what would displease you. Uh, Lord, it's a sad story that we've just read. A man and his whole family lost their lives because of his lusting, and 36 other families lost their loved ones as well. And Father, I pray that as the body of Christ, we would never think that our personal sins don't affect the body. They do. When there's sin in the camp, it angers you and it affects everyone. So we pray, Father, for the good of the, the church and for the ability to personally serve you, that we would keep these this lusting in check and dismortify do what pleases you, and have your presence with us that we can go on and be victorious. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.